Good morning, everyone. Day the 14th of November 2023. Mark continuing to read from Arthur Pink's book, The Holy Spirit, Chapter 20. He's ready for Part 2. We'll finish up this chapter today. This book is available through many outlets. You can go to Amazon.com and pick up yourself a copy if you're interested. Who is sufficient for such a task? Who can expect to gain the victory over such a powerful enemy as a dwelling sin? Who can hope to put to death that which defies every effort the strongest can make against it? Ah, were the Christian left entirely to himself, the outlook would be hopeless and the attempt useless. So thank God such is not the case. The Christian is provided with an efficient helper. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. First John 4.4 4. It is only through the Spirit we can in any measure successfully mortify the deeds of the body. So the real Christian is delivered from condemnation and freed from the reigning power of sin, yet there is a continual need for him to mortify or put to death the principle acting of indwelling corruption. His main fight is against suffering sin to bring him into captivity to lust of the flesh. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Enter into no truce. Form no alliance with, but rather reprove them. Ephesians 5.11 Say with Ephraim of old, what have I to do any more with idols? Hosea 14.8 No more communion with God is possible while sinful lusts remain unmortified. Although sin draws the heart from God, entangles the affections, discomposes the soul, and provokes God, and closes the ears against our prayers, Ezekiel 14.3. Now, it is most important that we should distinguish between mock mortification and true between the counterfeit resemblance of this duty and the duty itself. There is a pagan mortification which is merely suppressing such sin as nature itself discovers, and from such reasons and motives and Nature to suggest Romans 2.14. This tends to hide sin rather than mortify it. It is not a recovering of the soul from the world unto God, but only acquiring a fitness to live and less scandal among men. There is a popish and superstitious mortification which consists in the neglect of the body, and the body abstaining from marrying certain kinds of meat and apparel. Such things have the show of wisdom are highly regarded by the carnal world, but not being commanded by God. They have no spiritual value whatsoever. They masquerade the natural man instead of mortifying the old man. There is also a Protestant mortification which differs nothing in principle from the Pope as certain fanatics excuse some of God's creatures out of the man. Abstinence when God requires temperance. True mortification consists first in weakening sin's root and principle. It's of little avail to chop off the heads of weeds while their roots remain in the ground, nor is much accomplished by seeking to correct outward cat habits while the heart be less neglected. One in the high Peter cannot expect to lower his temperance while he continues to eat heartily, nor can lust the flesh be weakened so long as these feet are make provision for. Romans thirteen fourteen them second in suppressing the rising of inward corruptions by turning a deaf ear to their voice, by crying to God for grace so to do, by pleading the blood of Christ for deliverance, make conscience of evil thoughts and imaginations. Do not regard them as inevitable, still less cherish them to turn the mind to holy things, third, and restrain its outward actings, denying ungodliness, etc. Titus 2.12. Though grace be right in the hearts of the regenerate, it is not in their power to act it. He who implanted it must renew sight and marshal it. He through the Spirit and mortify. First he it is who discovers a sin and is to be mortified, opening it to the view of the soul, stripping it of its deceased, exposing its deformity. Second he it is who gradually weakens sin's power, acting as the spirit of burning, Isaiah 4 4. Assuming the dross, third he it is who reveals, supplies the efficacy of the cross of Christ, in which there is contained a 
sin, mortifying virtue, whereby we are made conformable unto his death. Philippians 3.14 For if he it is who strengthens us with might in the inner man, so that our grace is opposite to the lust of the flesh, are invigorated and called in the exercise. The Holy Spirit is an effective helper. Men may employ the aids of inward rigor and outward severity. They may for a time stifle and suppress their evil habits. But unless the Spirit of God work in us, nothing can amount to true mortification. Yet note well, it is not if the Spirit do mortify, nor even if the Spirit, though you do mortify, but if you through the Spirit do mortify. The Christian is not passive, but active in this work. We are bidden to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness, the flesh and spirit, Second Corinthians 7.1. We are exhorted to build up ourselves our most holy faith and keep ourselves to love God. Jude 20 and 21, Paul can say, I keep it in my body and bring it under subjection. The first Corinthians 9, 27 is by yielding to spirits, impulses, heaving, strivings, submitting ourselves under his government and any measure of success and grant us in this most important work. The believer is not a cipher in this work. The gracious operations of the spirit were never designed be his substitute for the Christian's charge of his duty. True, his influence is indispensable, though it relaxes us not from our individual responsibility. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. First John five twenty emphasizes our obligation and plenty of inmates that God requires from his people something more than a passive way for him to stir them into action. Oh my reader, beware of cloaking a spirit, slothful indolence under an Apparent jealous regard for honor of the spirit. There's no self effort required to escape the snares of Satan. Or refusing to walk in those paths God has forbidden. No self effort to be made in breaking away from the evil influence of godless companions. There's no self effort called for the throne of unlawful habit. Mortification is a task to which every Christian must address himself with prayerful and resolute earnestness. Nevertheless, it is a task far transcending our feeble powers. Going through the Spirit to any of us can acceptably and effectually in any degree find the of the body. He it is who works in us, a loathing of sin, a mourning over it, a turning away from it. He it is who presses upon us the claims of Christ. Reminding us that inasmuch as he died for us, we must spare no efforts to die to sin. Striving against sin, Hebrews 12, 4, confessing it, First John 1, 9, forsaking it, Proverbs 28, 13. He it is who preserves us from giving way to despair and encourages us to renew the conflict, assuring us that ultimately we will be more the conquerors through him that loved us. He it is who deepens our aspirations after wholeness, causing us to cry, creating me a clean heart of oh God, Psalm 110, moving us to forget the things which are behind and reach forth into those things which are before, Philippians 3.12. Be through the Spirit and mortify the deeds of the body you shall live. Here is the encouraging promise that before the solely tried Contestant God will be no man's debtor. He is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11, 6. If then by grace we deny the flesh and cooperate with the spirit, if we strive against sin and strive after wholeness, richly shall we be recompensed. To say that Christians are unable to concur with the spirit is to deny there is any real difference between the renewed and those who are dead in sin. It is true that without Christ we can do nothing, John 15.5, yet it is equally true, though far less frequently noted, quoted that I can do all things through Christ, but strength is me, strength me, strength is me, Philippians 4.13. Mortification and dedication are inseparable, dying to sin, living unto God, are indisputably connected. The one cannot be without the other. If we through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, then only then we shall live, live a life of grace and comfort here, live a life of eternal glory and bliss hereafter. Some have difficulty here in that Romans 8.13 conditions life upon our performance of the duty of mortification of the gospel. There are promises of life upon the condition of our obedience the promises are not made to the work but to the worker and to the worker not for the work not for his work but for Christ's sake according to his work 
as for example, promise of life is not is made not to the work of mortification, but to him that mortifieth the flesh, and that not for his mortification, because he is in Christ, and his mortification is a token or evidence thereof. And there therefore it must speak remember that all promises of the gospel that mention works include and then reconciliation with God in Christ the New Perkins sixteen oh four. The conditionality of the promise then is neither that of causation or uncertainty, but of coherence and connection or means. He that soweth the spirit shall the spirit reap the life everlasting Galatians six eight. Let it be pointed out that sowing of a field with grain is not accomplished in a few minutes. So lengthy and laborious task calling for diligence and patience. So it is with Christian mortification is a lifelong task. Neglected gardens neither easily nor quickly rid of weeds. Much care is required for cultivation of herbs and flowers, nor is a long neglected heart with its indwelling corrupts its powerful lust. Brought into subjection to the Spirit by a few spasmodic efforts and prayers, it calls for painful and protracted effort, the daily denying of self, application of principles of the cross, to our daily walk, earnest supplication for the Spirit's help, so be not weary, Galatians 6 9. In conclusion, let us seek to meet the objection of the scourge Christian. True mortification must not be only in striving against emotions and inward corruption. Call to the weakening of its roots, then I fear that all my endeavors have been in vain. Some success I have abstained against the outbreakings of lust, but still I find the temptation of it as strong as ever. Perceived no decays in it, but rather does it grow more violently each day. Answer that is because you are more conscious and take more notice of corruption than formerly. When the conscious and take when the heart is made tender by a long exercise, one occasion, the less temptation troubles it more than the greater did formerly. The seemingly strengthening of corruption is not a sign that sin is not dying, but rather an evidence that you are spiritually alive and more sensible to motions. Condensed from Ezekiel 5 to 68, to whom we are indebted for several leading thoughts in this chapter. Next time, the chap- chapter 21, the spirit leading. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Okay, we will continue this tomorrow, chapter 21. You have a good day today.